Hello all, I hope that you have your ears pricked and your eyes wide open to hear about one of the UK's fastest growing sports, mixed martial arts or MMA. I'm going to be discussing the history of MMA and how it has come from a niche sport to the vastly commercial sports that's today with a globalised audience and athletes. Now when I say MMA, many will quickly jump to the UFC founded by Dana White in 1993, however we will be back to this later. The term mixed martial arts as a sport dates back well before the 90s, but in fact dates all the way back to the ancient Olympic Games at the round of 648 BCE. Yet instead of using a mixture of Muay Thai, Judo, etc., the combatants used Pancration, which was the general fort fighting style of the Greek armies at the time, which similarly included throwing, punching and grappling the opponent. The only rules of the game consisted of no eye gouging and no biting, so a pretty brutal sport to say the least. The sport kept its notoriety within the Olympic Games and was revered as one of the most popular, which is funny considering its popularity in modern day almost 3,000 years later. However, despite its popularity and the popularity of the Olympic Games, around 393 CE, the Roman Emperor Theodosius banned the Olympic Games, thus bringing an end to the sport. The sport was plunged into obscurity, leading to its resurgence in lesser mainstream practices, to say the least, underground fight clubs. The sport luckily made a resurgence in the early 1900s in Brazil and was pushed by two brothers, Carlos and Helio Grassi, who coined the sport Vale Tudo, or in English, Anything Goes. The sport garnered its first taste of commercialisation when the brothers used to put advertisements for their sport in the local paper, challenging people to come and take part. The brothers vastly underestimated the proclivity of their newfound sport and were shocked to find how many challenges turned up, let alone the amount of spectators. So many, in fact, that the facilities could not accommodate the numbers and soon had to move to football stadiums to cater to the vast numbers. This is one of the earliest forms of commercialisation, simply by putting an ad in the paper. The sport has come a long way since then, so before we get into that, we'll first look at commercialisation in sports itself. As discussed by Wigglesworth et al., Commercialisation was first brought about when local pubs and taverns began to host or provide social facilities to the sports participants and spectators, as well as hosting their own games to be played in the pubs. Further discussed by Wigglesworth is that the pubs and taverns noticed such an increase in revenue that they began to hire out cricket grounds to host their own sporting events, which in turn they could use to promote other events. Another set of pioneers in commercialising sport were the aristocracy and nobility, who would find Finance, theatres, clubs and sports through investing their own money which they would make back through spectators and gambling. Reading this, it is easy to see that outside interests play a big part in the promotion of sports and leads on to how commercialisation in sport can be defined as done by by Beach and Chadwick. Commercialisation is the process increasingly found in sports where a business or businesses from outside the sport have become significant stakeholders in the sport in order to make a direct or indirect profit. This certainly rings true in modern day MMA slash UFC and especially as we see many outside businesses vesting their interests within the sport such as Reebok's sponsorship of the UFC. From 2017 Reebok are giving athletes up to £5,000 per octagon fight at a starter level while champion athletes in the sport receive up to £40,000 per fight. Though it seems that Reebok are just pumping money into the UFC without the UFC giving them any tangible money back, this is a form of indirect profits as the average UFC fight night brings in around 1.5 million viewers on channel Fox 30 alone. That's 1.5 million people who will be exposed to Reebok's brands and have therefore been indirectly advertised to. In our modern era, sponsors can afford to invest these vast amounts of money into the sports as viewership has become come a long way since buying your admission tickets. Now people can view the sports such as MMA on various media platforms from live television, radio podcasts and, most popular of people, illegal streams. Although not mixed martial arts but boxing, with MMA frontman Conor McGregor versus Mayweather, it is thought that the fight was viewed by up to 50 million viewers via illegal streams while only 4 million tuned in via pay-per-view. Without such technologies as the internet streaming platforms, or the event, for the event and in turn sponsors would have only been seen by around 10% of the overall viewers if not for the illegal streams. This leads us on to why sponsors seem to have a much more vested interest in champion athletes as stated before, the champion athletes receive up to 8 times the revenue from Reebok sponsorship than lower level athletes. This is due to a free, free aspects of selling public performance to audiences and further selling the audiences to sponsors. As stated by Coakley and Pike, the three aspects are marketing hype based on myths and images of the players or teams, athletes who are entertainers or even celebrities, emphasis on the heroic actions in addition to aesthetic actions. One needs to look no further than the recent Conor McGregor versus Khabib fight where 
the marketing hype was indeed vastly emphasising on the athletes' widely different personas. The two athletes even had nicknames, McGregor's being the Irish Gorilla and Khabib's the Eagle, which adds to the marketing of the fight. With all this hype, viewers would presume that they were about to watch two demigods battle it out when in reality it was simply two professional athletes competing in the sports competition. However, as said by Coakley and Pike, this is exactly how the fight was supposed to be marketed. To create a hyper-real fighter experience, to draw people in to watch, and then in turn expose those watching to the various brands and affiliate sponsors of the UFC. Globalisation. Sporting events like this would not have such commercial success they do without having such a versatile globalised market. Five decades ago, such events would have been localised to the arena or venue that it was held in, or possibly even the radio. Yet with the development of technologies such as satellite television and the internet, such events can be broadcast across the globe. This has led to a huge increase in viewership of most sports, including the MMA, through UFC and Bellator, who have seen exponential growth due to these developments in broadcasting. As mentioned before, the McGregor-Khabib fight was a huge sporting event and was broadcast across the globe through many formats. A mainstream platform being pay-per-view with a staggering 2.7 million viewers who bought the package with people either via home entertainment or bars and clubs. This vastly beat the previous record of pay-per-view purchases when McGregor fought Nate Diaz with 1.65 million purchases. This again is vastly different to the first ever UFC tournament with only 86,000 pay-per-view purchases back in 1993. This exponential growth of viewership across the globe, which has, has led to the nature of sports consumption and production to change to cater for a wider audience and in turn have changed the economics of sport to a more corporate model. With UFC now being a global organisation holding events in 21 different countries, they own the rights to all sporting events held, so have therefore benefited exponentially to the rise of broadcasting and sponsorship income. This benefit comes from giving them free reign to sell broadcasting rights of their events to various broadcasting services. For example, the UFC made the five-year deal with broadcasting service ESPN, in which ESPN paid the UFC around $1.5 billion to broadcast their events. In this current global market, popularity-demanded sport is seeing rapid, rapid growth, with the UFC having a net worth of around $4.2 billion in 2016, and in 2017 rapidly expanded its net worth to around $7 billion, almost doubling its net worth in just one year. The UFC has shown increasingly more and more popularity worldwide and in turn has shown the characteristics of globalisation and embraced them. The characteristics of globalisation as put forward by Grattan et al. are the escalation of broadcasting rights for global sports events. This is shown in the UFC as mentioned before, the broadcasting rights were sold to ESPN for $1.5 billion for a five-year broadcasting deal. The second characteristic being global marketing of major sports events by using images recognisable worldwide. An obvious example of this in MMA would be none other than Conor McGregor, who, who is undoubtedly the face of MMA. He has a net worth of around £69 million, far more than his UFC counterparts, and has sponsorships with multiple brands from Burger King, Monster, Reebok, and more. In conclusion, after what we have looked at today, it is clear to see that the exponential growth of the expansion of the MMA or UFC across the globe with the speed of its growth over the last 20 years, only the future will tell what the next 20 years hold for the sport.